I know what you're thinking. If only somebody out there could teach me how to organize the speech I'm about to give in an ancient Greek court. Well, my friends, look no further. Today, I've got you covered. Welcome, one and all, to the grand finale of our series on Aristotle's rhetoric. And by grand finale, I mostly kind of mean anticlimactic final fizzle. Not that you shouldn't keep watching, of course, just that we're sliding into the part of the rhetoric that I find the least useful for us now. Well, maybe except for the very long list of emotions and things that Aristotle rambles through in somniferous detail earlier on, but this last section is a close contender. And that's because it might actually have been one of the more practically useful sections for his students when he was teaching. See, the early part of the rhetoric develops Aristotle's theory of rhetoric, what it is and how it works in general terms. And throughout this series, we've talked about how rhetoric is an art that enables one to find the available means of persuasion in any given situation in order to persuade large audiences made up of regular people. And this is something that requires an awareness of emotions, demonstrations of good character, and skillful and sound reasoning. And even if the situations that we find ourselves in now are really different from the political situations that Aristotle's students were preparing for, the more generalized theoretical work that we find early on in the rhetoric still remains reasonably useful. Now, though, as we come to the end, we get to see Aristotle explain each of the major parts of a political speech and how to adapt those sections to deliberative, judicial, and epideictic situations. In essence, Aristotle is providing outlines for his students and explaining what each section needs to do. If you're getting ready to deliver a speech in the Athenian court, this is a helpful thing. But since none of us are in a hurry to give that kind of speech, the specific guidelines for an epideictic epilogue, for example, aren't really that interesting or useful. But it would feel wrong to end our tour of the rhetoric without actually finishing the book, and there are still some interesting conversations to have about larger principles that are still useful to us. So I'll tell you a little bit about what Aristotle says, but then we'll move on to talk more about why we might still care, and then we'll call it a day. The last few chapters of the rhetoric rehearse the standard parts of speeches, not to be confused with parts of speech, and the role that each one plays in discourse. And they are, first, the proemion or introduction. Aristotle says that its main function is to make clear what is the purpose for which the speech is being given, as well as to make the audience well disposed and attentive. Two, the diegesis or narration, which probably plays the largest role in judicial rhetoric and involves going over the facts of the case. Three, then comes pistis or proof, which is, in the words of translator George A. Kennedy, a somewhat rambling chapter that discusses the ways that speakers can demonstrate their position, or essentially to show that their position is reasonable and sound. Fourth comes erotesis or the interrogation, where a speaker questions the position of their opponent. Fifth and finally, epilogos or conclusion, which serves the purpose of getting the audience to sympathize with your position and disfavor the opposition, to reaffirm what you demonstrate in the proof section, move the audience to an appropriate emotional reaction, and remind them of the major points in the argument. So, there you go. There are, of course, some variations. A judicial paremion, for example, has a slightly different job to do than an epideictic one, but the broad strokes remain consistent. Of course, none of us are about to litigate a case in an ancient Athenian court, so why do we care? And honestly, that's what I'm asking myself. Luckily, though, I think there are some answers. While the five-step speech pattern that Aristotle describes isn't particularly useful for writers now, there are still some useful things to draw from what Aristotle presents. In other words, while the templates themselves probably have limited value, they do represent a useful application of important rhetorical principles. First things first, where rhetoric is about finding the available means of persuasion in a particular situation, an outline like the ones Aristotle provides are an example of a particular way that someone has successfully found and employed the available means in a particular context. That is, when you encounter a new rhetorical situation, it can be helpful to see how someone else handled a similar situation. And if you're one of Aristotle's students, you may not have argued a legal case before, but an example can show you what has worked before. If I show you an outline that most legal arguments follow, it makes sense to outline your own argument in the same way. Why mess with something that works? In fact, this reality is at the foundation of how genres come into existence. 
genres are essentially stabilized, effective responses to common rhetorical situations. So for example, cover letters don't exist as a thing by themselves, but they exist as a typical way to respond to the kinds of situations that call for job applicants to introduce themselves and their qualifications. In other words, employers aren't looking for cover letters, they're looking for information about job candidates. And cover letters have come to be a standard and effective way to do that job, just as Aristotle's outline for a legal argument represents a standardized and effective way to win a legal dispute in ancient Greece. But again, it's not a quality of the document or genre that makes it good. Aristotle's judicial speech is not good because it has a proemion and a demonstration of proofs. It's effective because those sections are purposefully selected and arranged to offer a successful response to a given situation. Think about it. If you're arguing a case before an assembly of your fellow citizens, what kind of steps are you going to want to take in order to win? Well, it makes sense that you would start with an effort to earn your audience's goodwill and give them a sense of where you're going. That you'd then work through the facts of the case so that everyone is on the same page about what happened. That you'd explain your position and reasoning and why they should accept your interpretation of events. That you'd challenge your opponent's position and that you'd then conclude with a reminder of the soundness of your position and a final appeal to your audience's goodwill. These are not steps you would take because it's a rule. They're steps you would take because they work, and they work well in that order. And this might seem like an insignificant distinction, but it can mark the difference between a writer who really knows what they're doing and one who's just faking it to make it. I once had a student who came into my class and shared that they had a standard outline from a previous speech teacher that they said would work for any argument. Well, it didn't take long before I started pointing out how that standard outline was leading them astray for the kinds of arguments we were writing in my class. The fact is a universal doesn't exist. It can't exist because rhetorical situations are so varied and complex. Even where Aristotle provides a standard template that talks about the five major sections of a speech, he still leaves a lot of room for an individual speaker's judgment. Yeah, it makes sense that you'll want to earn your audience's goodwill in every situation, and Aristotle says as much, but how you earn that goodwill will be different in nearly every situation. So Aristotle says you should do it, but he can't really say how to do it in every single case. Broad categories of rhetorical situations exist. This is why examples and templates can be helpful, and this is why AI can generate a cover letter when you ask for one. The kinds of situations that call for cover letters are similar enough that many cover letters also end up looking fairly similar. But every situation, even in the same category, is also unique. And if you're going to write a really successful cover letter, you're going to need a real understanding of your specific situation. When I was finishing grad school, for example, and looking for jobs, one of the most common reminders I got from my advisors was to modify each cover letter to each job I was applying for. Sure, there were some things that could remain consistent across every version, but every job was different, every institution was different, and a cover letter that didn't show my sensitivity to those differences could disqualify me immediately. And this is why, at least in its current state, outsourcing your writing to AI strikes me as such a foolhardy decision. It can create a statistically probable version of a generic cover letter, but it can't know the nuances of a particular rhetorical situation. Even if you tell it things about that situation, it still doesn't really know anything about the available means of persuasion, nor can it actually work out a rhetorical strategy. It has templates, but it doesn't really know what it's doing with them. Templates just aren't the goal. Yes, Aristotle delivers some that are, again, fairly generic and loose, but he only does it after spending pages and pages talking about people and audiences and situations and strategies and effective interventions. He doesn't teach his students what a political speech should look like. Instead, he explains how political speeches work so that his students won't just be following a template in ignorance, but will know what they're doing and why they're doing it, and even when to abandon the template when the situation calls for it. Outlines, guides, and templates can be a comfort, but then what do you do when you're up against a situation that you've never been in before, or worse yet, that nobody has been in before? You can look up a template for a cover letter, but you're going to have a hard time finding a template for an email to send to a professor when you need them to reconsider the results of an audition for a performing group, or when you need to negotiate a dispute with a neighbor over who owns the plums that fall off the tree on the property line, 
or when you need to have a discussion with your partner about the dishes that never seem to get washed. In those cases, you might be able to find general advice, but you're sailing in unique and uncharted rhetorical waters. In those cases, no template is going to save you. But that's not an issue if you have a sufficiently deep knowledge of how to find and implement the available means of persuasion. Take stock of the situation, consider your options, and then respond in a way that is suited to your unique circumstances, your specific audience, and your particular goals and purpose. In the end, templates and tools can be useful, but they can't replace actual know-how. We all could have saved a lot of time if Aristotle had just given his students a stack of generic outlines and said, here, these usually work out just fine in most situations. But people continue to talk about Aristotle's rhetoric because the underlying principles, the rhetorical theory that makes up the bulk of the text, continue to offer some insight into human communication. Of course, rhetorical theory has come a long way in the thousands of years since Aristotle taught his version, but we can still see the roots of a lot of key ideas in what he had to say. Chief among them is the idea that effective persuasion happens in context, and it requires a knowledge of a range of things like reasoning, emotions, audiences and their priorities, language, and organization. A knowledge of rhetoric is reflected in a person's ability to look at a situation, size up the complexities and tensions of the moment, and then present a fitting and effective response. Rhetoric is a valuable tool for finding our way through the complexities of our personal and political lives. And a good knowledge of rhetoric can make all the difference between clumsy, misguided communication and meaningful cooperation and progress. It's not just about saying what you have to say, but doing what you want to do. General outlines and tools like AI can help you to create a proliferation of words, but they aren't capable of applying the kind of purpose-driven and context-sensitive thinking that's needed to speak or write at a highly effective level. When you uncritically outsource your writing to someone or something else, you surrender your voice and give up your agency in situations where your contributions could be needed most. With a good knowledge of rhetoric, though, you put yourself in a position to make a real difference. And that, I think, may just be the lesson from the last chapters of Aristotle's rhetoric. Yes, there are reliable models for some kinds of discourse, but those models are always insufficient by themselves, and they're no replacement for real rhetorical knowledge. But anyway, thanks for watching this video, and hopefully the whole series up to this point. Of course, I hope you'll continue to stick around and check out the other writing and rhetoric videos on the channel. One of the joys of rhetoric is that it's been around for so long that there's just no shortage of things to say about it. But I do think we've all had enough of Aristotle, at least for now. So maybe we'll pick up something a little more current, like, I don't know, the Rhetorica ad herenium or something. Who knows? Either way, thanks again for watching, and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon.